why don't we move right along to our featured speaker for today. Um, and that is Michael Chasse here, who is a biologist with the National Park Service at Golden Gate National Recreation Area. Um, I want to give a big thank you to Naomi Lebeau, who does work out at PUC, for putting me in touch with Michael and recommending him as a speaker for our meeting series. Uh, Michael is in his third decade of service at GGNRA. His primary work focuses on ecological restoration, rare plant conservation, and volunteer engagement. Michael's recent special projects include restoring habitat for two endangered manzanitas in the Presidio of San Francisco and the reintroduction of an endangered dune wildflower at Fort Funston. Michael earned a master's degree in geography with a concentration in resource management and environmental planning from San Francisco State University. And today we'll get to hear from Michael on his work restoring habitat for rare plants in the Golden Gate National Recreation Area. So I'll pass it over to you, Michael. Thanks, Shoba. Good morning, everyone. Um, so nice to see so many familiar faces and names on the call. Hope you're all doing well. I'm going to go ahead and share my screen and start up a PowerPoint here. And I'll give a few moments to make sure folks can see it. How's it look? All right. Looks good. OK. So yeah, a lot of my talk is going to be focused on work we're doing to restore uh, rare plant habitat in the GGNRA, um, but I do want to start with um, some kind of background information on the the park that I work for, the division I work for. Um, but before that, just really a breakdown of the structure of the talk. Um, so first, it's going to be an overview of the Natural Resources Division here in the GGNRA, who we are, what we do. Then more specifically talking about vegetation management here in San Francisco, the bulk of my work. The other thing I do here in the park is coordinate the rare plant monitoring program. So I'll go over some of our extremely rare plants, um, highlight them and the work we're doing to take care of them. And as Shoba mentioned, I'll, I'll talk about two of the special projects that we've been working on here in the city and then leave plenty of time for questions and answers at the end. So with that, I wanted to start. Um, I'm not going to read a lot of slides, but I do want to read um, the mission of the National Park Service because it really is it's the structure for all that we do here. So the National Park Service preserves unimpaired the natural and cultural resources and values of the national park system for the enjoyment education and inspiration of this and future generations. And so does anyone see the inherent tension in that mission? I think there have been PhD dissertations written on the challenge in, in preserving, especially preserving unimpaired, the nature of our national parks, the cultural resources, but then providing for the enjoyment. Um, it's, um, it's a challenge. Many of you probably are aware that our national parks are loved and, and often loved near to death. <laughs> um, visitation is up through our parks. It especially peaked through the pandemic. Um, so it is very much a challenge to, to balance both preservation, restoration, and then providing for enjoyment, recreation, et cetera. More recently, the Park Service has added this sort of addition to the mission, and that's speaking to the value of partnerships for the National Park Service. And of course, here in the GGNRA, we have a valuable nonprofit support partner in the Golden Gate National Parks Conservancy. Um, we do a lot of work with the Presidio Trust, our, our fellow federal um, agency here in the Presidio. And especially up in Marin, we do a lot of work, a lot of collaboration with California State Parks. Because of the number of endangered species we have, a lot of work in collaboration with the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service. Um, we work with local botanic gardens on various projects, and the list goes on. So partnerships are quite important to our park and other national parks. So the overall structure within the GGNRA, um, we don't have a CEO or a president. We, we, our, our leader is called the superintendent. So we have a superintendent's office 
who oversees all of park operations. Then we have these various divisions. Um, and so the, the first row below the superintendent's office, these are a lot of the behind the scenes folks, health and safety planning, et cetera, um, but very important roles, making sure people's checks get sent out properly and, and doing proper planning for projects that are, that are done in the park, um, archeology, span et cetera. Um, the bottom row are really the folks that you would probably encounter most often if you visit a national park. So visitor and resource protection, that's our law enforcement rangers. Interpretation, the folks giving tours or working at the visitor centers. Facilities management, folks doing the important job of taking care of our recreational spaces, trails, and then the division that I work for, natural resources. And so our division, natural resources, we also have a mission, which is here, I'll let you read that. But essentially, we're looking at restoring and preserving ecosystems. Um, we're using science um, and you know, the best available resources and information we have, but also trying to connect the public with the work that we do. And I'm gonna talk about volunteerism in a bit. And then, Collectively, our division came up with these values that we have. We sort of had sort of a visioning session and we identified these five values as the, really the most important to our division. Um, some of these really speak to what you'd expect for a natural resource division, conservation, excellence, et cetera. But in recent years, there's really been an emphasis on, on wellness and, and self-care in all our divisions and, and also within natural resources. So it may be interesting to see joy as a value within a natural resource division, but we really feel like, you know, being content and, and happy with our work is an important value within our, our, our division. So the structure within natural resources here in the park, we had to have a division lead, oversees various sort of specialty areas. We have a wildlife ecologist, we have someone focused on wetlands and physical science. We have an aquatic ecology program and then a vegetation ecology program. And so my work is underneath this vegetation branch. Underneath this branch, we have four main areas within the park or sort of regions that we've defined. Two that are in Marin, both north and south. One in San Francisco, which is the one that I lead. And then we also have a, um, an area down in San Mateo County. So these bubbles kind of represent the areas that my team manages, and it's supposed to not necessarily to scale, um, but represent the, the amount of time that we spend at these different areas. Um, so you can see the Presidio, what we call area A, which is the coastal areas of the Presidio underneath Park Service jurisdiction really requires the most amount of time. Um, but Fort Funston also is an area that we do a lot of work in. Um, the smaller areas like Ocean Beach and China Beach, Fort Mason, we don't really do a whole lot of work there in terms of natural resource work. Um, but there are some things that happen there that that my team would be involved in. So, so this gives you the overview of, of how natural resources is structured here in the GGNRA. To give some geographic context, here's the park map. You can see the dark green shows areas that are within what we call our legislative boundaries. Um, some of these areas we don't necessarily manage. They're actually owned and managed by other agencies, but are within our legislative boundaries. So up in Marin County, for example, Nicasio Ridge, Olima Valley, and part of Bolinas Ridge even though they're within our, our legislative boundaries, they're managed by the Point Reyes National Seashore and the Range Management Program. But areas like Redwood Creek Watershed, which includes Muir Woods, Tennessee Valley, and the Marin Headlands are fully under management of the GNRA. Here in San Francisco, again, our primary areas, the Presidio, Land's End, Ocean Beach, Fort Funston. And then in San Mateo County, we have all of these areas here that, again, the San Mateo team manages. 
both vegetation and also wildlife work that happened down there. You'll notice on the map, you'll see San Francisco Peninsula watershed. It's another example of an area that's within our legislative boundaries, but we do not manage that area. SFPUC owns and manages that area. But we have done some monitoring and have collaborated with them in the past. OK, so now I'm going to kind of drill down more specifically on the work that I do here in San Francisco and in, in, in terms of vegetation management. Wanted to start with this. You may be familiar with the um, the wild in the city poster. We've used this poster quite a bit in our our programs to speak to kind of the baseline conditions of San Francisco prior to European arrival, the types of habitats for here and how it's changed over time. So prior to European arrival, again, there's there's a variety of habitats that were here in San Francisco. Um, it's important for us to understand what the conditions were. Um, this is called historical ecology. It's important to us when we design restoration to look at the past to, to help guide the future. So starting in the upper left and working clockwise, we have um, dune habitats, various assemblages of, of dune plants. We have um, ponds and lakes. Even in the outer Richmond and Sunset districts, there were there were dune ponds. Um, we had grasslands with an abundance of wildflowers and then several creeks that flowed through San Francisco um, with what we call riparian habitats with coast live oak, arroyo willow and other riparian vegetation. San Francisco, as I'm sure you all are aware, it developed rapidly after the gold rush. Here's a sort of artist's rendering of what San Francisco looked like just within about 20 years of the gold rush in 1868. You can see the city has been growing westward all the way out to there's that hill in the middle that's Lone Mountain. Where the University of San Francisco is now. Uh, so quite a bit of, of development and loss of habitat within a short amount of time. But here really in the western part of the city, a lot of that open space still intact by the, the late 1860s. And here's this is one of my favorite um, images of of the western part of San Francisco. It's a painting from 1870. Um, anyone could guess where this is. If you look at the future in the the left in the background, of course, that's Ocean Beach. Um, and the outer sunset district, as we call it now. But the foreground is really what fascinates me. This area in the foreground is roughly the outer Richmond district. That hill on the right side of the painting is Sutro Heights. And you can see the rich and dense vegetation of this dune ecosystem here in the outer Richmond district. And so we often think of dunes as you know barren, open sand, similar to like the Sahara Desert. Um, and there were areas like that in San Francisco, like the Outer Sunset District, but much of the sand dune areas in San Francisco, they supported this very rich and diverse vegetation community, as you can see in the foreground of this, this painting here. Of course, a lot of that area was converted for various uses. First farming and then later um, housing development. So this is roughly out the outer Richmond district so that what's now Golden Gate Park is on the right where the sand dunes are. So taming the sand dunes back in the 1880s. Fortunately, there still still are good representations of this this dune habitat, which was really the most common habitat in San Francisco. Um, this kind of stabilized, again, very um, diverse dune habitat. This is at Fort Funston. So looking at diversity overall in San Francisco, this is, I did a search in iNaturalist. Many of you may be familiar with this, this app. Um, I just looked at the number of plants still existing in San Francisco. 
based on iNaturalist research grade observations. So about 1,300, that's a, that's a pretty impressive number of, of plants in an urban area like San Francisco. Of those 1,300, about 700 are native. So over half are native species still hanging on. And then again, roughly 600 introduced. And many of them quite invasive, which we'll talk about in a little bit. So this is this is the team that I work with. We're a team of three right now. Um, I have a full time field worker and uh, and an intern, a year round full time intern in the areas that we manage are here. They're they're colored here along the coast. Presidio Area A, again, the National Park Service jurisdiction of the Presidio. Um, China Beach, Land's End, Sutro Dunes, Ocean Beach, and then Fort Funston here. So our, our primary, again, our primary uh, mandate is restoring habitat, protecting and restoring habitat here in San Francisco with the goal to increase, to preserve and increase biodiversity. So why is that important? So biodiversity, in addition to things that it could do for humans, there's also ecosystem services and, and biodiversity. We are facing habitat loss. Again, invasive species is a really big challenge here in the city. And of course, gl global climate change is looming over all of what we do. Some of the main elements of, of habitat restoration, at least in the way that we um, practice it here in the GGNRA, uh, we do hand collection of seed in our remnant habitat areas, use those seeds to propagate plants for our projects. We do outplanting, both with contractors and also with volunteers. And then again, invasive plant control um, being the bulk of our work. So a quick rundown of the, the kind of the primary invasive plants that we work with the most. Um, annual and perennial grasses take up a lot of our time. We do have areas where these grasses are direct threats to our rare wildflowers. Um, some of these grasses like annual grasses may not be a concern in habitats like riparian systems or dense scrub systems, but in grasslands or open dune areas, where we have wildflowers that are fairly small in stature, these are really important invasive plants to control. Actually, I'm just noting fillery is not a grass, by the way, it's an annual form. It should be on that list that I just pulled up. Um, we have other things that threaten these wildflowers. Um, you all are probably seeing the amazing oxalis or sourgrass blooms this time of year, which always provoke anxiety within restoration practitioners throughout the Bay Area. Other plants that really require a lot of our time for control are the, are the vines like Cape Ivy and English Ivy. And then we have shrubs and trees that we actively are managing um, in our restoration sites. Just wanted to go over some of the techniques that we use. I mean, these might be different than how restoration is done in other areas. Um, a lot of these are fairly particular to the kind of the urban environment, but hand removal is one of the more common techniques we use. We have a pretty solid volunteer base, so that helps to be able to do a lot of hand removal. These are some of the tools that we use most frequently. We also use power tools where it's appropriate. Um, we have we have chainsaws and also we have um, trimmers that work especially well with invasive blackberry, as you can see in this photo. For control of annual weeds, we've been using landscape fabric quite a bit. It's it's a great technique where once you get a flush of weeds when the rains first hit, you know, say in November in the fall. 
we install landscape fabric, we leave it down for a certain period of time, say four to six weeks, remove it, all of the annual weeds are killed and then we're able to plant into it. And we often see emergence of native annuals in the seed bank once we remove the landscape fabric. Um, so this has really been a great technique we're using around rare annual populations. Something we've used a little bit is propane flame torches. A similar approach where we're trying to kill seedlings that are emerging after the first rains. Um, it's not a it's not a technique that my team uses that often, but it is definitely in our toolbox. We've also used something called hydro weeding. Um, so it's a high pressure water pump basically that cuts um, plants right at the soil surface. We've kind of had mixed results with it. It's again, something similar to flaming where we don't use a whole lot of, and not in recent years. You really felt that other techniques were more effective. Then of course, herbicide, it, the park, the National Park Service policy is this is a kind of a last resort approach. And especially here in San Francisco with high visitation, we do try to avoid using herbicide as much as possible. But there are some invasive plants that you, there's just no other option. Hand removal, mechanical removal, power tool use um, just isn't effective. And some of these invasive plants are threatening endangered plants. And so we do have to resort to herbicide use when appropriate. Let's kind of go over a few of the, the lessons that we've learned here in our park. Um, and one is really, it's important just to develop some sort of criteria that would help prioritize all the different areas that we're managing. And so I shared that map and the different areas that my team manages. And then we also divide those areas up into smaller geographic units. And it can be quite overwhelming to look at the whole, all of these areas and all the things that need to be done. And so we've developed a, a, a criteria to help kind of prioritize what are the most important areas and then what are areas that maybe we could kind of set aside, just kind of let go of for a while, just given the amount of resources that we have. And it, it's it's a rough criteria and, and maybe we will adjust it over time, but really something that helps us evaluate these areas. Does it have rare plants or animals? Um, what are the invasive plant threats to it? Um, you know, has the park invested quite a bit in those areas? So. Um, that's really the first lesson that, that I wanted to share. The other is a sort of standard, you know, restoration practice as you work outward from your highest priority areas and move out based on the resources you have and really not try to take on more than really you can manage and not bite off more than you can shoot. And then also, of course, being realistic about how much you can do with the resources you have. Um, I mean, it's it's easy to really kind of get caught up and look and wanted to manage everything, every square foot of all of our areas, but that's a one step forward, two or three or four steps back type of approach. We'd rather, and, and of course, there's some step back every year in what we do, um, and I'll talk about that in a little bit. We have, you know, government shutdowns, COVID, um, we have, bird nesting season that really halts some of our work, staff changes, et cetera. Um, so it's really important that we really have a realistic idea of what we can do in a given year. And one thing that I, I repeat quite a bit, just being willing to let go of areas that are low priority. As much as that it's difficult for us to do, maybe areas that we've worked in in the past, um, we can only do so much with the resources we have. And so really being willing to kind of let go of some of these lower priority areas until we have the resources to address them. And then it's always great to just try out new things um, and talking to other people in the field, going to conferences, just networking with people and asking what are people doing that's working, trying out new things and seeing if it works better than what we're doing now. And lastly, I, I think 
and I've again, I've worked in the park for almost 30 years, and I've seen a value in long term observations of our work, treatments we've done, how they've worked. I think, you know, when I first came into the park, there was a lot of emphasis on sort of short term formal experiments. We do something for a year and it's not always the most accurate information if it's really a short term, even if it's a formal experiment, it's just a snapshot in time where I would recommend really looking at, even if it's informal, your experience over a long period of time and what's worked and what hasn't. So I just wanted to pause there for a bit, um, and then if there are any questions at this point, um, you can put them in the chat. Maybe I'll take about a minute or so, and maybe Shoba, you could read if anyone has any questions at this point. But I'd have to sort of pause before we talk about volunteerism. Yeah, sounds good. If anyone has comments or questions, feel free to type them in the chat. I'll ask you a question, Michael. Mm -hmm. um, you mentioned the value of networking and troubleshooting amongst peers working in different areas. Are there conferences in particular you like to go to for that? Yeah, I think the ones that are that have been most valuable to the folks within my division, and especially within the vegetation branch, uh, the California Invasive Plant Council Conference, um, I think has been really valuable. Um, the California Native Plant Society conferences also, I think, have been great. Um, and then Society for Ecological Restoration. Those are sort of the big three organizations for our field. But because a lot of our work is invasive plant control and removal, the California Invasive Plant Council Conference really, I think, is kind of the favorite. Um, in my work in particular, I do a lot of work with rare plants. So the CNPS, the California Native Plant Society Conference, is, is, I think, also quite helpful. Right. Okay. We do have a couple questions in the chat. Sure. Okay. One, um, well, and they're kind of related. Um, it's, what is your favorite spot in GGNRA to work in? And maybe what's the most undesirable or frustrating area for you to work at? Mm. It's a good question. Hard to pick a favorite. Um, I have to say though, the the annual survey that we do on Nicasio Ridge in Marin, which again is managed by Point Reyes National Seashore, but GGNRA does the monitoring of the rare plants there. It's a fantastic serpentine grassland, serpentine being the, the rock type there, with just a whole bunch of rare plants. Um, it's a it's a very intact serpentine grassland system and just surrounded by lots of open space up in Marin. It's not far from Samuel P. Taylor State Park, kind of in that area, um, the northern section of sort of Bolinas Ridge. Um, Nicasio Ridge is is just it's a wonderful spot. And then um, frustrating areas. Well, one very challenging area for us to work in is the um, the bluffs near Fort Point, that fort that's right at the southern end of the Golden Gate Bridge. It's also a valuable serpentine habitat there with a number of rare plants, but with steep cliffs that are impossible for us to just to manage on a regular basis. So we have to actually hire folks with special like repelling skills to to go down those slopes and treat things like jubana grass and other invasives that are on that slope and so um we're hoping to actually hire a crew to do that in the coming years but that's a really tough area to work um and then you know baker beach is a popular area for people to feed wildlife you probably experience this in some of the city parks um but that's kind of it's it's you know, it's a challenge to educate the public on why that is not the best thing to do. Um, but there is sort of a this like practice of folks going there and feeding the ravens and other wildlife. And um, so that's hard to see. But. Um, yeah, any other questions? 
There are a couple more in the chat, but I'm also mindful that you've got a couple more sections you want to go through in your presentation. Um, maybe we can hold the additional questions until later. That's that sounds good. Yeah, we can we can cover those at the end. Right. All right. So so volunteerism. So I mentioned that part of the work that we do throughout the park, and especially here in San Francisco, involves getting the community to help us out, um, connecting folks to their local nature. And so we have several different experiences that we have for volunteers to be part of. Um, we have regular weekly programs. Um, so I host a program with my team every Wednesday morning, every Thursday afternoon. And we move around to these sites that I mentioned, Fort Funston, Presidio Area A, Land's End, et cetera. Um, we also do special groups by arrangement. So, you know, corporate groups, service fraternities, schools, et cetera. Um, and so those are sort of like special programs. We'll, we'll do events like on Earth Day and um, MLK service weekend, things like that. And then we partner with the, the Presidio Trust and Parks Conservancy around these programs. Um, so they're, the Parks Conservancy, for example, really is our, our, our public interface with volunteerism, where volunteers go through the Conservancy's um, volunteer registration system and then come out to our programs. Um, and then the Presidio Trust, especially, you know, the programs I do here in the Presidio, we're collaborating all the time on, you know, the techniques we use and how we approach volunteerism. So I wanted to talk about some of the impacts to our programs. COVID-19 really had, of course, we could go on about the impacts across all levels of society. Um, the first impact it had for, for our work is our volunteer programs were completely shut down. Um, even our field work, we couldn't do field work for a while. Our staff couldn't go out and do field work. This was, you know, the, the height of, you know, what, March and April 2020. Um, which really kind of set us back. Um, and we had to come up with very strict protocols on both returning field workers as well as volunteer programs back to the field. Um, shout out Naomi. I think Naomi's on the call for taking this picture. But just kind of an example here, we have five people in this picture. Three of these positions were discontinued during the shutdown. Um, and one of them, unfortunately, was we were able to find funding to, to replace that position. But um, there was a staffing reduction um, during COVID and that had a huge impact on our work. So the, our nonprofit support partner relies heavily on income that's generated through visitation to our parklands. And of course, during COVID, Alcatraz was shut down, your woods was shut down. And so a lot of that funding was just, it dried up immediately. So that was a huge, huge impact on, on our programs. We relied quite a bit on support from the Parks Conservancy for habitat restoration in the park. So just a few lessons learned for volunteer work. Um, really key to look at the work we have and decide what's really appropriate for volunteers. Much of our work is not if it's on steep slopes, if there's lots of poison oak or other hazards. Um, over the years, I think we've we've become a, more mindful about safety with our volunteer programs and have become a bit more conservative in our approach and really trying to pick out projects and sites that are most friendly and safe for volunteers. I think it's also important that we explicitly list out well what are the different elements of our program like one we have to we have to plan and do prep work on our sites before volunteers come out making sure that we are identifying any hazards and mitigating those hazards um, identifying really who's who's doing what within the program we have an opening circle we're explaining the work we do giving some background we're talking about safety um, pointing out what folks have to be aware of um, so we've kind of written up here in my program, you know, a list of all of the different components of a volunteer program and who's doing what, what they entail. 
Again, similar to just habitat restoration for volunteer work, we have to be realistic about what we can do, how many volunteers we can host given the staff that we have. Um, again, we I have a team of three. And again, if someone calls in sick or is away on vacation, it's down to two. And so we really think a lot about the ratio of the number of staff to volunteers and really trying to keep it on the lower, safer side. Prior to the pandemic, our volunteer programs, we call them drop-in programs where folks can just show up. <laughs> the, the location was posted publicly. And so we would never know. We, would we get five people? Would we get 20? We would, would we get a dozen kids coming out for volunteer service for their high school? And so that makes it very hard to plan for the work. And also, you know, if you do get a, all of a sudden you get 30 people out unexpectedly, it makes it very difficult to manage. So we now require volunteers to let us know in advance if they're coming out. And this is probably something that most other volunteer programs do. Um, but for for many years, we did not require RSVPs and we're finding there's great value in that. And I think our programs are running much more smoothly with with the registration process. Also, I think really kind of setting parameters around how we're engaging with volunteers. Um, again, th this this ties into you know, volunteer friendly projects where we're working. Um, but really, you know, how many volunteers do we want on certain sites? We're working in sensitive habitat in some areas. And so setting a maximum number of volunteers is sometimes necessary um, for certain sites. We may only be able to accommodate so many people in a certain area. Um, so it's important that we think about that, that it's just we, you know, we can't set, oh, it's we can have 20 people every time. We may actually have to to adjust the amount of people we can host based on where we're working. And again, safety has to really be part of all of these considerations. Okay. So I'm gonna, this is the next section of the presentation. I'm going to talk about what we're doing with rare plants, with monitoring and management of our rare plants here in the park. We have a lot of rare plants. <laughs> um, this map shows every dot is an occurrence of a rare plant somewhere in the park, all the way up from Alima Valley and the Ocasio Ridge, all the way down to the Flager State in San Mateo County. Um, we have 45 rare plants, both federally and state listed. That does not include plants that we consider locally rare. They may be more common elsewhere, but very common here in San Francisco or here in the Bay Area. Of those 45, 13 are listed as endangered or threatened at the federal level, at the highest level of protection. There are four rare plants that we know were here, but are presumed to be no longer here. And because the historic record is not very precise, there may have been more rare plants here in the past um, that have been lost and we don't know that they were here. And then some predictive modeling based on our habitats suggests that maybe six, give or take, rare plants may still be out there that we haven't found yet. So that speaks to the importance of, of continual surveys of our areas. All right, so this is kind of the one interactive part. Um, if folks that are um, open to it, if you could type in the chat your guess of which three states have the most federally listed species? For most for NPS units, National Park Service areas, which states have the most federally listed plants and animals? Let me take like a minute for a few guesses. And then show maybe you could read some of the some of the responses. Absolutely. Yeah. Yeah, folks, feel free to type into the chat what your guesses are for what are the three states in our country that have the most federally listed species. So some of the guesses I'm seeing come through are Hawaii, California, Alaska, Texas, Florida, 
Utah, Montana, Nevada. Nice. Well, Oregon. the top th the top three have been mentioned already, so folks have got it. Uh, the first one is Hawaii, and so these three national parks in the Hawaiian Islands have the most federally listed plants and animals of any of the national parks. But here in California, we're number two with these four parks. And then someone mentioned Florida. That's the other state that has the most federally listed plants and animals. So, um, and if you think about these areas and how they might be different from the rest of the United States, well, Hawaii, of course, is an island system, right? Florida is in the tropics or a good chunk of it. And then we have this Mediterranean type climate here in California, which is different than the rest of the continental US. Great, thanks for, for uh, participating in that. So now I'm gonna highlight the kind of the rarest of the rare, our, our extremely rare and federally listed species, starting with the Franciscan manzanita. It is federally endangered, only found Historic locations only known from San Francisco. Same thing with the ravens manzanita. Ravens and the Franciscan manzanitas grew together um, on serpentine chaparral here in San Francisco and known from nowhere else, also federally endangered. Another serpentine endemic, again, only found on soils derived from our state rock, serpentine, is the Presidio Clarkia. It's an annual. So I talked about annuals. I, I may not have, uh, have explained what that is. It's a plant that basically goes through its entire lifespan in one season. So seeds germinate when the rains come. It blooms in the spring, give or take, or maybe summer, as the case may be, produces seeds, and then completely dies. So the population has to regenerate from the seed bank every year. Another serpentine annual is marine dwarf flax. It's considered threatened at the federal level. And this is our smallest of rare plants. It's a tiny little wildflower. And then San Francisco lysingia, which is a dune annual, and it's federally endangered. Only found here in San Francisco and one other area in Daly City, and that's it, that's it in the entire world. It's global distribution. A few other rare plants here in San Francisco that are rare at the state level, not federally listed, but considered rare by the California Native Plant Society. Here's an example of some of those. Um, so the, the gilia, the dune gilia grows on sand dunes like Lysingia. Um, You have some rare wetland plants. The bottom left, the Franciscan thistle, is restricted to wetland habitats. And then something like coast rock cress and wallflower grow mostly on our kind of rocky areas, openings within in scrub habitat. So how do we monitor these rare plants? Well, the basic level for monitoring is just really, is the plant there or not? And so we, we call this presence or absence. And so this picture shows us checking on our endangered manzanitas. We check every single one, see if it's there or not, um, assess its health. We also map our rare plants. Um, this is kind of an old school GPS unit. We're transitioning to using newer techniques like using tablets and, and phones um, to directly map things into ArcGIS online. Um, but we still find that this is a very accurate way of monitoring our rare plants. We map locations either with points, point data, or if it's a large population, we may map what's called a polygon to show the full spatial extent of a population. And then for some plants, we do want to come up with some quantitative measurement, either through a population census where we, we count every single individual in a population, um, the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service is the agency that's responsible for federally listed species, and we're required to report to U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service every year, um, either with an estimate of a population size or an actual number. 
And for some of our smaller populations, we do try to come up with an actual census so that we can compare trends over time. And so if we see a downward trend in a population, that would really trigger some sort of management action that we would take on a population. This is Nicasio Ridge, by the way. And so two, I want to talk about two of the special projects we're working on with some of these federally endangered plants. Uh, the first is for the two manzanitas that I just mentioned, the Franciscan and Ravens manzanitas. Uh, we applied for and received special funding from the National Park Service to do restoration for these two plants. Again, only found in San Francisco. And so there's a little bit of a backstory that I want to go into for these plants. Some of you may have heard this story, but maybe you haven't. It's an interesting story, so I'll share that. So first of all, the Franciscan manzanita. This is a photo from the former Laurel Hill Cemetery, uh, which is now the Laurel Heights neighborhood. That area was developed in the 1940s. And again, the Ravens Manzanita, which grew with the Franciscan Manzanita throughout the serpentine areas in San Francisco. It grew at Mount Davidson. Also at the former Masonic Cemetery, now the University of San Francisco. That that church, that St. Ignatius Church is still there. Obviously, the cemetery is not. Also, you may be familiar with the DuBose Triangle area. This is now where the U.S. Mint Building is, roughly at, I think, Buchanan and DuBose near Market Street. So that's a big serpentine outcrop. So those are three areas where these manzanitas are, are known to have, have grown together. But the last place they grew is Laurel Hill Cemetery. And so this is a view to the Northwest. You can see Temple Emanuel in the distance here um, on Lake Street uh, at Arguello. And so there was a serpentine outcrop here. Again, here's our state rock. All of that, it was a rock quarry in the cemetery. Uh, they weren't able to dig graves into serpentine rock, and so this area of serpentine habitat persisted all the way into the late 30s. And we have Alice Eastwood, botanist extraordinaire, to thank for discovering these, or at least discovering to science, that these were unique plants only from San Francisco. Alice Eastwood was the curator of botany at the California Academy of Sciences for over 50 years. Um, went out to the Laurel Hill Cemetery, um, took specimens of these plants and described them as new species. The photo on the right was taken, I don't know if you can read that label. It was taken in 1938 by a, a professional photographer, a studio photographer. This was shortly after the city voted to remove all of the cemeteries in San Francisco. And so this is essentially a farewell portrait of the, the Ravens and Franciscan Manzanitas at Laurel Hill Cemetery. And that's what that area looks like now, almost exactly to the spot where Alice Eastwood was standing. That's the saddest street sign in San Francisco. Um, you can see the Laurel Hill Playground sign in the background. So that's Euclid and Manzanita. Um, so serpentine habitat, no more. Fortunately, there were several uh, horticulturalists who were kind of pioneers in native plant horticulture and propagation. They were aware of how rare these manzanitas were. So they went into the Laurel Hill Cemetery, sometimes in the middle of the night, and dug out these plants to save them from extinction, from complete extinction. They were brought to the Tilden Botanic Garden in Berkeley, the UC Berkeley Botanic Garden. There are some examples in the San Francisco Botanic Garden. One of the main collectors was Lester Roundtree, who actually did climb over the cemetery walls in the middle of the night, dug plants out to save them uh, and bring them to to the gardens in, in the Bay Area and beyond. The Ravens Manzanita was not known to be unique 
plant until a guy named Peter Raven rediscovered the plant in the Presidio in the 1950s. Um, here's a photo from early 1970s. By the time it was rediscovered in the 1950s, it was the last individual plant of its kind on Earth. No other individuals of this species existed. You may see some things have changed over time, but the plant is still there in that same spot. And we think it's over 150 years old because recently we found a, um, a uh, specimen, some branches that were collected from the plant back in the late 1860s. It's a very, very old plant. So there's a, a YouTube video you can check out that really talks about the story of the rediscovery of the Franciscan Manzanita here in the Presidio. It was thought to be extinct in the wild. Again, it was saved and brought to botanic gardens, but was thought to be gone from wild habitat. Back in 2009, was um, observed by a local ecologist driving by the Presidio on the highway. That's what that area looked like, right where Highway 1 splits off from 101, just south of the Golden Gate Bridge. Unfortunately, with all the construction of the new Presidio Parkway, the plant had to be moved. So 20,000 pounds of manzanita were lifted out, driven on a, a, a trailer in the middle of the night, brought to a new area, a serpentine area, so an appropriate habitat area that's, that's protected. Uh, and there it still is today. A few years later, the, the Franciscan manzanita was declared as an endangered species. Critical habitat was designated for it here in the Presidio. And some of the work that I did when I was a graduate student at San Francisco State was to identify the highest potential areas for restoration and reintroduction of the Franciscan manzanita. Again, as I mentioned, we received funding. We removed some non-native trees. We prepared the habitat for planting. We worked with local botanic gardens to grow plants that were, as I mentioned, were gathered from the cemetery back in the late 1930s, propagated those plants and started planting them out starting in 2018. So this doesn't include our more recent surveys um, but as of 2022, we had planted close to 300 Franciscan manzanitas and close to 40 Ravens manzanitas in this critical habitat area. And so after a year or more, we, we come out, and we do the, the monitoring of every single plant every year. After at least a year, we wait for a year to do the, the monitoring. We now have close to 100 Franciscan manzanitas and 10 Franciscan manzanitas that are persisting in our planting sites. So roughly a 30% survivorship. Not great, but it's better than zero. So we, we do have plants out in habitat that were not there before. And so we're starting to reassemble this rare habitat with these extremely rare manzanitas. What we found is that the larger the container, the better the survivorship. So this is a big lesson learned for this project that using, so TB10, that's a tree pot, using that has really given us way better survivorship than the smaller containers. The smaller the container, the lower the survivorship rate for our plantings. And this is a project that's ongoing. We'll have plantings in the future. Um, actually, the, the monitoring that we did a couple of weeks ago, we now have 150 Franciscan manzanitas that are have persisted for at least one year out in these critical habitat areas. So again, some of the challenges with this project, we've had low survivorship. Again, it might've been due to container size that was too small. We've had some pathogen issues at our nurseries. Um, we're still kind of working on that, trying to sort of figure that puzzle out. It's not Phytophthora, which is a very common pathogen that we have been concerned about and introducing best management practices to avoid. But these are other things like they're, they're sort of fungal pathogens that have developed in the nursery 
um, that have reduced the number of plants we've been able to plant out. This picture here will show we have a big challenge with social trails. Um, folks like to hop fences to take pictures. Uh, you can understand why the, the areas around the Presidio Bluffs and the Golden Gate Bridge are, are you know, very scenic. Um, but we have these social trails and trampling that's happening in some of these areas. So it's actually directed where we plant. We're now trying to plant to avoid some of these areas where people are hopping fences. We, we, we don't really have a presence of law enforcement out in these areas. Um, and so that's a big challenge where, you know, my team, we're not out there every day, so we can't educate the public on an everyday basis. And we don't really have a lot of law enforcement that's kind of roaming around checking on these areas. So, um, so that's an issue as well. And then of course, invasive plants, it's something that we're, we're dealing with all the time in all our areas. It's also a bit of erosion. Some of these areas are below roads and the stormwater systems aren't in the best shape. So we've had some issues with erosion and downcutting because of stormwater outfalls. And again, climate change looms over all this work. Um, now, chaparral habitats are predicted to actually do better with predicted climate change, but there's no guarantee. Um, so this is always something that's kind of on our minds. So the other project is reintroducing this endangered wildflower, San Francisco Lysinja, to Fort Funston. I mentioned that it currently is in two areas, the Presidio and an area in Daly City. Um, there's historic records of it from Fort Funston and the recovery plan, the plan that was written by US Fish and Wildlife Service has recommended reintroducing it to Fort Funston because it is a historic location and that area is under park service management through our natural resource and vegetation management program. Um, so it's in the sunflower family. It's a tiny little sunflower. Um, again, only found in openings on what is usually dune scrub systems. So the sort of sandy openings with shrubs mixed in with shrubs. Again, only down to two locations by the 80s, and that's why it was listed as endangered. So it was known to have grown throughout the sand dune systems on the northern San Francisco Peninsula. Um, all the way through Richmond Sunset Districts, down past Lake Merced and into Daly City. So that yellow is its historic range. This is its current range. So you can see the yellow in the Presidio, but you probably are hard pressed to see that little yellow dot down there in Daly City, but that's the Daly City Lysinja population way down there near the bottom of the map. And this is a, this is what that daily city population looks like. Let's in the foreground and neighborhoods right below the hill. Part of this area is privately owned, so there is a threat of development in the future. So this population isn't maybe the the you know the most secure of all the populations. So that pro provided really more incentive to bring Lysenja to Fort Funston in case we do lose this population. So I mentioned the recovery plan. That's that on the upper left. And the map shows areas that are within the sort of recovery plan area with Fort Funston outlined as one of the areas to reintroduce San Francisco Lysenja. There are a few rare wildflowers already at Fort Funston, and so we're kind of using those areas. We're identifying those as the highest potential areas for reintroducing San Francisco Lysinja. Um, Dune gilia and San Francisco spine flower are two of the other rare plants. They're state listed, um, but their habits, they generally occupy the same types of habitats as San Francisco Lysinja. So we received a permit from San Mateo County Parks to collect seed from the Daly City population. 
We grew plants in containers, even though it's an annual, we wanted to see if growing plants and planting in containers would do better than direct seeding. We also did the direct seeding to compare the two. We found that direct seeding actually has worked better than planting container plants. Some of the challenges with this project, we've also had low survivorship of Lysingia. We've had very little survivorship of the plantings, so that really didn't seem to be the way to go. Um, we haven't had great germination through direct seeding, but we have had some success, and so we do have um, Lysingia that's re-emerging from seed bank after direct seeding, but the numbers have been small so far. Lysingia is directly threatened by invasive annual grasses and annual forbs. Um, so a lot of work is being put in to reduce those pressures. And just like the Manzanitas on the Presidio Bluffs, Fort Funston has a lot of social trails. There's a lot of trampling. Um, as the picture suggests, um, the folks at Fort Funston, not all of them are good about keeping their dogs under control. Um, and so there's a bit of trampling that occurs because of that. And, and again, like the Manzanitas, that has kind of driven our selection of areas to do restoration for Lysingia. And also, we really don't have a regular presence of law enforcement out there to educate dog owners about the rules around, around dog management. Um, so that is, that is a concern. And climate change again, looms over everything. That's it. So hopefully there's some time for, for questions.